you visitors that are with us today. Thank you for coming out and being in our services. Thank you to all of our members who are here today. Uh, the good looking crowd this morning. Well, with the exception of one or two, but uh, for the most part, it's a good looking crowd. Uh, we're, let's, let's have some fun. Let's sing some songs this morning. Let's worship him and all that we do today. So stand with me. Let's sing just over in the glory land. There may be some people here that you'll see there. I don't know. I'm a home prepared where the saints abide just over in the glory land. And I long to be by my Savior's side just over in the glory land. planning to be there. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. That was most everybody. There'll be somebody coming to talk to you in a minute. <laughs> It's because of Jesus. It's because of his name and what we believe in in our lives and believing in him and trusting in him. You are my strength when I am weak. That's who he is in our lives. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my Give up, I'd be a fool. 
praise him right here. Jesus, oh Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Take my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my Here a few months ago, we introduced a song that most of you knew from, from previous. It was called The Goodness of God. Sorry, what did I say? Oh, you, I thought you were laughing at me, Henry. You know, <laughs> Henry, if anybody's going to laugh at me, Henry's going to be that one. But there, there was a song that's called The Goodness of God. And I love the song. I love the, what, the words in the song. And if you don't know it, please just read, listen to the words, read the words. But there is a line in the song, it, 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 it's, if you know anything about musical lyrics, there's a, it's what they call a bridge, and they, it's, it's a repeat, and it says, your goodness is running after me, is running after me. I thought, I don't know exactly what that means. What does that mean? And I thought, well, you dummy, the scripture tells us that his goodness runs after us. Psalms chapter 23, the last verse, verse number six says, surely goodness and mercy shall what? Follow. Follow me. There is a, one, of the, one of the versions of the Bible says, Surely goodness and mercy shall pursue me all the days of my life. So I, I'm glad that we have a song that we can sing where Jesus' goodness and the goodness of God follows us, works after us, looks after us, pursues us, and is running after us. you at 
I'm glad surely goodness and mercy follows us, pursues us every day of our life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity to worship you. Thank you for the opportunity to let others know of your goodness and your faithfulness and the trust that we have in placing you each and every day. We love you. We praise you. We ask that you would just bless Steve as he brings this message to us this morning, just hiding behind the cross and giving the words that you've already given him this week. In Christ's name, amen. We're going to be continuing on the topic of spiritual warfare, and we're going to be looking at today in Luke chapter 4. We're going to be all over the place, but our primary text is Luke chapter 4, where Jesus comes under spiritual attack. Now, I think, it's, I think it ought to be noteworthy to us of how Jesus handles spiritual attack. I mean, he was fully human. He's also fully God, but he came under spiritual attack directly by Satan. So we're going to look here in chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended, he became hungry. Now, I think that's an understatement, don't you? I mean, 40 minutes and I'm hungry, not 40 days. But you know what? People have survived a 40-day fast before, but some people don't survive it. Probably not many of us in this room would survive a 40-day fast. We're not conditioned to do that. But I'll tell you this, Jesus, after 40 days of fasting, was in bad shape. This was extremely, extremely difficult. Now, why did he find himself in this horrible situation? Did you notice what it said in the very first verse? It said, he was led by the Spirit. You mean, the Holy Spirit led Jesus into a time of suffering and a time of great testing. Yes, he did. Guys, do you think that happens today? 
Do you think that he leads people or people are led into a time of testing and suffering? I think that can certainly be the case. We can go through times of great blessing and we go through times of great suffering. Many families here in the body are are going through a time of great suffering right now as we speak. But then again, we have to consider. Remember when we looked at the book of Job, what victory looks like and what failure looks like. Remember, Job did not, through all of the suffering that he went through, Job did not sin with his lips. He did not curse God and die, even as his wife suggested. And therefore, his wife at the same time, she kind of failed the test, right? She was used by Satan to try to trip up Job, and she kind of failed that. Well, we don't want to fail. And so, guys, you know what? When we, when we are on the top of the mountain, and we are just blessed to no end, praise the Lord. But guys, whenever things turn around and he leads us into the wilderness, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Know this. Many families in here are going through a tough time. We've prayed and we've prayed and we've prayed for them. And if God has not removed that path from them, he may remove it today. He may remove it tomorrow. But at the same time, today, they're called to go through that path. Otherwise, God would have removed it. We prayed for him to, to work through that. And we know that God works through passionate, fervent prayer. So now Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, and I'll tell you, this is very important for dealing with spiritual warfare. We have to be led by the Spirit. We have to be, you know, I wonder how many Christians today even know, really know what it means to be led or taught or counseled by the Holy Spirit or convicted by the Holy Spirit. We must be led by the Holy Spirit. So now he returned from the Jordan, was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. Now, it says after 40 days he was very hungry, and I think that, uh, like I said, is an understatement. I mean, 40 days in the wilderness. It also says that he was tempted by Satan. Now, we have basically the last temptation, and we're going to look at these three that he faced, but this was kind of continuing on. I don't think it was just at the end on the 40th day that Satan tempted him. So now I want to show, I want to go ahead and show something, what not to do, okay? Because there's some scriptures, and we're going to see how Jesus deals with this Okay, and I want to show you some scriptures going to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 through 6. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. So now Jesus recognizes in, the, in this wilderness, don't you think he recognizes? Yeah, his, his flesh is about to die. I mean, he is in very bad shape. But at the same time, he recognizes that this is spiritual. This is spiritual warfare. So guys, we also are in a spiritual war, and there are casualties, there are difficulties, there are struggles, all for the cause of Christ. And I want to tell you this also. If God hasn't removed something from your path, and you have been praying passionately and fervently about it, then there must be some purpose that you're going through it. To a Christian, we never suffer without purpose. We never go through difficulties without purpose. Okay, it's always going to serve some purpose and some good. So always know that. So for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive. You ever thought about that? We take every thought captive. You know, that could be taken the wrong way, too. Like, if you have a bad thought, I'm going to take that bad thought, and I'm going to take it captive, and I'm going to hold on to it. But that's not what's going on here. You see, whenever you're tempted like Jesus is in the wilderness, Satan is going to put a thought in his mind, and he's going to deflect that away and then take thoughts that are good, take thoughts good in his mind, because God blessed us with the ability to only think of one thing at a time. I don't know if you knew that or not. Some of you think you can multitask, but what you're actually doing is flip-flopping back and forth between two because your mind can only think of one thing at a time. So now, guys, what that means is if Satan puts a thought in our head, we deflect it, and we think on something good. Now, what's going to happen if Satan puts a thought in our mind and we just keep dwelling on that, dwelling on that, dwelling on that? I'm not going to eat a donut. I'm not going to eat a donut. I'm not going to eat a donut. What do you think is going to happen? <laughs> so you're going to eat a donut. You know, we'll get to the armor of God, right? And there's a helmet, there's a shield, right? A belt of righteousness, a sword of truth, sandals, 
the gospel of peace, which is the purpose. We'll get to that. And so look at this. Take every thought captive. We have to be very careful. Whenever Satan or one of his demons or whatever puts a lie in our mind, we get rid of it and we think on something else. And we're going to see what Jesus does. He does not dwell on the lies. He rejects them by the word of God and we'll see it. All right, continuing down. Raised up against the knowledge of God and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. So now, turning now all the way back to Genesis because I want to show you, see, in the garden, Satan again is there like he's there with Adam and Eve, right? And we're going to look at the first six verses and I want to show you what happens when you de don't deflect those thoughts that are put in your heart or your mind from Satan and you contemplate them, right? I, I'm not going to eat a donut. I'm not going to eat a donut, right? Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Now, it's, this isn't real problematic at this point, except she's kind of distorted the word of God because God didn't say if you touch it, you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die, for God knows that in the days you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from it and ate. So you see what she's doing? She's considering what Satan is telling her. She's sitting down and thinking about it. Well, Jesus Christ does not do that. We'll see, and the reason I'm doing this before is because I want you to see as we go through it. He does not sit down and contemplate Satan's words. He does not entertain the idea of what Satan has promised him. It's a total rejection, and he's taking his thought captive next by putting the word of God there instead. That's what he's doing. Let's move back to our primary text in Luke now. I don't know if I finished Genesis or not, but that was the point I wanted to make out of it. Luke chapter 4, starting at verse 3 now. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. Okay, and so there's the scripture. Exactly what I told you. Jesus didn't sit down and think, well, I am quite hungry. I mean, I, I could turn those stones to bread. Is that really a sin or isn't it? I'm not sure that that's even a sin if he turned those stones to bread, right? How would that be wrong anyway? His 40-day fast, if, the, if he was led to, do, led to do that, well, I don't think it's the Lord's will. And also, listen, what Satan is trying to do here is trying to get Jesus to use his godly powers to serve himself. That's what he's trying to do in the hopes that if he does that, how tempted will he be to come off the cross? See, and that's the problem. But Jesus says, no way. I'm not going to do it. What does he do? Immediately, right? It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Immediately, that's out of Deuteronomy. Immediately, he rejects Satan's statement as a lie, as a rejection. It's not the right thing. He rejects it and then puts the word of God out. And see, this word of God is not just going out, it's in his mind. He's replacing Satan's thought with the word of God. Now, guys, just a little heads up. If you don't know, if you've never studied the word of God much, how are you going to do this? Jesus didn't say, hang on just a minute and get out a scroll and start looking through it, right? There's got to be something here. That's not going to be of a great help, is it? I mean, anytime you're in the word of God, it's a help. But man, we have to be in the scriptures and even memorizing short scriptures. We can do that. This is not a long scripture. Jesus didn't quote him off half, half of Deuteronomy. He just quoted this one little verse. Man shall not live on bread alone. Now, so what is the problem here? Jesus is being tempted. Now, he's very hungry. And he can so easily turn those rocks to bread. He can so easily do that but he's not going to do it. And he quotes the word. Now, do you think Satan uses this technique on us also? Maybe not Satan directly, but the enemy? Oh, I do. And what is it, what it may be is like something like this. 
God's not going to provide for you. Maybe God doesn't love you. Look, you've been in this wilderness now for 40 days, and you're about to die. Does God really care about you? You know, I think of the statement of a uh, better take care of number one, and you know in that statement who number one is, right? Well, this wasn't, this was a spiritual benefit for Jesus to go through this, but this was not a physical benefit. It wasn't good for him physically. Now turn to Hebrews chapter 13. We are going to be all over the place today, but it's, it's just good, good stuff. The word of God, right? Hebrews chapter 13, 5 and 6. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? So he see here is saying, you know, watch your character and be content with what you have. And really, that is the key to happiness. Have you ever seen a person that becomes a billionaire and that's not enough? They just keep, keep pursuing and they're never content. But guys, I'm an Aggie football fan. I went to A&M. I'm content with where A&M is. And Jerry and I were talking about that today. The key to being happy and not frustrated is being content, right? And so that's the case with each and every one of our lives. We must be content with what we have. That is the key to happiness. Paul said, I've learned the secret to being content in any and every situation. The secret is the riches in Christ and the promises. Living your life based upon the promises. Do you trust God? You know, if you're on a mountaintop, that's easy to do. But if you're in the valley going through the wilderness like Jesus is here, that's hard. Do you see a Jesus in the middle of all, these, all this struggle in the wilderness and being tempted and tempted and tempted? He never gave up on trusting God. He was fully human, but he was also fully God. And he experienced it. And I promise you this, I don't think anybody, anybody on the face of the earth has ever been tempted to the magnitude that Jesus Christ was here and also in the Garden of Gethsemane, and everywhere in between. It was very important for Satan to try to get him to fail. And sometimes, look at this. Remember I told you the, the rocks turning the bread is not really, that's not that big of a deal. But you see, it, it's always the same. Little things lead to big things. So you think Satan still uses that with us today? If he can get us to slip up on some little thing, then perhaps the next one will be a little bigger and a little stronger. So be content. Be content. Set your eyes on eternity above. Be content with where you are, knowing that God is going to use you and use your life, whether you're suffering or whether you're in a blessing, for his glory, it serves a purpose. Now in verse 5, And he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I will give it to whomever I wish. That's true. You understand that we went back to Genesis, but when man sinned, man was given dominion over the earth, right? When man sinned, man gave that dominion basically to Satan. So Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He is the ruler of this world under a sovereign God who is allowing it to take place, but will bring it to an end. Always keep that in mind. So the devil is saying something true here. I will give it to whoever I please. So he's telling Jesus, fall down and worship me. Now, you know, we studied the book of Revelation for three years, right? And what happens at the end? Jesus basically inherits all the kingdom because of his work on the cross. So he's going to get everything. So what is, what is Satan basically telling him? Do it the easy way, right? Fall down and worship me now, and I'll give it to you now. You don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to do all those things. From right here at the beginning of your ministry, you can have it right now. A commercial that used to drive me crazy was that commercial where people were yelling, it's my money and I want it now. <laughs> Does that bother you too? Look, God's way is not always the easy way, except when it comes to salvation. 
He made salvation so easy a child can understand it. We just put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, trust him, believe in the resurrection, trust him for our salvation, and we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Now that is easy to do. It's basically waving a surrender flag. I surrender, God. I'm yours. I submit to you. I believe in you. Your blood has washed away my sins, and I'm a new creation. It's that simple. But living it out is a little harder to do, and we live in this spiritual warfare. And now, since you've done that, you have a bullseye on you because you are a Christian, and it is Satan's job or Satan's task to make you ineffective. So he wants to put lies in your head to make you ineffective. Believe that you're guilty. Believe that you're not saved. Believe false things about yourself. My, one of the funniest far sides I've ever seen was these two deer are standing up on their hind legs, talking, and one of them has a bullseye right here on his chest. And the other one says, bummer birthmark, Hal. So, Why, Hal? I mean, is that a good deer name, I guess? I don't know, but that, it's, I thought that was funny. But guys, now that you are a Christian, you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have a bullseye on you. You can't see it, but it's there. And so now Satan can't snatch you out of God's hand, but he can make you ineffective. He, he can make you believe lies and not stand upon the truth. So that's his task for you now to be ineffective so that you won't be a witness to other people around you. Now remember I told you about the valleys, how difficult valleys can be going through a time of sickness or pain or financial problems, whatever the case, how difficult those things are and how easy it is when everything is going great to praise the Lord. In fact, that's expected, isn't it, of a Christian? Nobody's surprised by that. But guys, what if we praise the Lord and give him all the glory when we're in the valley? Now that is unusual behavior. Remember Paul and Silas in prison sometime after midnight began singing songs and worshiping the Lord after they had already been beaten? Had a major impact on everybody in that prison. Could it be that we are called, sometimes we go through difficult pathways that we are called to praise him and exalt him? So now how does Jesus respond and the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. Jesus sat down and considered Satan's words. No, he didn't. Jesus says, it is written, also from Deuteronomy, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him. He didn't sit there and, he didn't sit there and consider that as a possibility. He rejected it and then replaced it with the word of God. You shall worship the Lord your God. I am not gonna take the easy way. And aren't you glad he didn't? Because if he had taken the easy way here, you wouldn't have salvation. You would still be in your sins. You would be condemned. Jesus said, I am not gonna take the easy way. And in a way, didn't Jesus kind of say here, I'm content to go down the path that God has given me. Oh, but man, the possibilities. I mean, if, if one of us were facing that type of thing, there's such an easy way out. I mean, it's so easy. He just has to fall down before Satan, and he could skip the three and a half years of ministry. He could skip the cross. He could skip all of that difficulty. He's not going to take the easy way out. Now, do you think Satan whispers those lies to us too? Sometimes following the Lord is hard. Not an easy path. Are we going to take the easy way out? Turn back to Hebrews chapter 12. I'll get there. Hebrews chapter 12, first three verses. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, now what he's just talked about, the Hebrews 11, is a faith chapter. And it goes through talking about Abraham by faith, David by faith, just over and over, all of the great things, the great people of the Bible who live by faith. 
And then he says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles it. You see, this the same thing. We lay it aside. Don't entertain it. Get rid of it. Replace it with something good. Replace it with the word of God. Lay aside every encumbrance and sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. It's not a short race, and it's a race that's set before us. And some of you in here, some families have gone through a difficult race lately. But what are you supposed to do? Run the race with endurance. I've heard it said before that we are not running a sprint. This is a marathon. And we just keep going. We keep praising the Lord no matter what. One step in front of another. One step in front of another. And we keep going and run the race that is set before us. Listen to this. How do we do that? Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Oh, now think of this. So now we have this comparison between us and Jesus. And what it's basically saying, run the race that's set before you. As an example, Jesus ran his race all the way to the end, didn't take the shortcut, ran it all the way to the end, endured the race that was set before him. And guys, I'm telling you, you will not, no matter what happens to you, you will not suffer like the Lord Jesus. A person came to me one time and they were frustrated. Well, they were frustrated with their spouse. And he basically was saying that he is, uh, he's suffered enough and that he's going to leave. Well, I, what I didn't know, he was already seeing somebody else. But um, <laughs> I said, you have not suffered like Christ suffered for you. You don't, she hasn't done anything wrong that's deserving of divorce. You haven't suffered like Christ suffered. Isn't that what this is saying? Look here, look at this example. Look, you're going to run a race of endurance. And it's going to have times of great blessing and times of difficulties. But then it says, look at our example, Jesus Christ. And no one, no one has ever suffered like Jesus Christ suffered. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Look at this, verse 3. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So we keep our eyes on Jesus. No matter what happens, Jesus suffered greater than we've He's been tempted far beyond anything we've ever been tempted with. He's suffered far greater than anything we suffered with. And he is our example. We keep our eyes on him. And guys, if you don't have your eyes, in fact, try this sometime. Try to run or even just walk, walk, all right, and turn your head. And you're trying to go over here. What's going to happen? Have you, ever, have you ever been in like cedar breaks where the cedar trees are real thick and you're trying to get from one side of a field to another? Guys, if you're not careful, you'll just be walking in circles thinking you're going in a straight line. You go around this tree and you think, okay, it's over there, go around this one. And you can be out there for hours just walking in circles. The point is this, he tells us to keep our eyes on Jesus. And it's not just because Jesus is God, it's because Jesus became fully man and Jesus suffered for us. Jesus was tempted in every which way for us. And so we keep our eyes on him because he is the finish line. And guys, if you're going through a difficult time in here, it's gonna come to an end. One way or the other because it's temporal. Keep your eyes on the finish line. Do not grow weary and lose heart. Jesus, after 40 days in the wilderness, nearly dead. He said, I'm not taking the easy way out. I'm not even going to entertain that idea. I reject it and replace it with the word of God. Now back to our primary text, verse 9 of Luke chapter 4. And he led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, 
He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. So now how is Satan attacking Jesus here? Well, he's, again, he says, if you are the Son of God, right? So he's trying to get him to doubt even who he is. And then he's also trying to get him to doubt what the Word of God says. Satan's quoting Scripture right there back to him. So he said, okay, Satan says, if you're going to use Scripture to keep yourself away from the, my temptations, then I'll use Scripture against you. But what does Jesus do? You know what he's going to do. But what is Satan attack, attacking him with his identity? Do you think he does that to us too? We already already seen God doesn't love you. God's not going to provide for you. Are you really saved? Are you really a child of God? Is the word really even true? If you have thoughts like that popping into your head, that's attack. Those are lies going contrary to Scripture. And so what do we do? What does Jesus do? Jesus right here says, It is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So yes, he could have jumped off that pinnacle. Isn't it interesting also, jumping off that pinnacle, requiring God to save him? Do you see the parallels with him on the cross? He would require God to save him from the cross. Isn't that interesting? Go to 1 John 3. Hold your place at Luke 4. We'll go back to that, and then that's the end. No more scripture flipping. 1 John 3, 1 to 3. See. See how great a love. Remember, God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So how do we see? We see by the word of God and we see by what Christ did for us. See how great a love the Father bestowed on us that we would be called children of God. So you, you understand who you are, right? What does the world say about you? Are you a failure? Failure? I mean, are you a sinner? What are, I mean, what does the world say? What does the word of God say about you? See how great a love he has for you. Even so, we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. So even in that scripture right there, you see what John is doing here? He's looking to the future. He's basically saying, you haven't seen anything yet. Right? We get so wrapped up in this or that here on this earth and this world and all this stuff going on. And God is basically over and over saying, you haven't seen anything yet. And if you read the book of Revelation, you'll see exactly what he means. You haven't seen anything yet. For now we see dimly, but then we will see face to face. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. And everyone, see right there, it's promising us. Remember, when he came out of that grave, he was no longer mortal. No more pain, no more tears. When he came out of that grain, the grave, he was immortal. And what is it promising us here? The same promise, we will be like him. You are promised a physical resurrection. Look at this, verse 3. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Now, amen to that. And guys, don't believe the lies of the enemy. I believe that is his main technique. Just like it was with Job. He wanted Job to sin with his lips. He wants to make you ineffective. And one of the ways he does that is by lies. He is the father of lies. So how do we battle that? With the truth. See, Jesus showed us right here. The word of God has showed us. Right? His identity was attacked. Jesus knows exactly who he is. And he doesn't have to prove it to anybody else. 
Jesus did not sin with his lips. Job did not sin with his lips. And that's what victory looks like. See, our Savior was being tempted. This is spiritual warfare. And I believe we also are tempted, like Jesus, but not in the magnitude that he was. I guess the question is, are we going to be victorious over it? Or are we going to be defeated? Now back to, back to Luke chapter 4. What an example Jesus is to us. Look at verse 13 now. When the devil had finished every temptation, that's why I think also this wasn't just these three at the end. He was working up to it, right? And this was, when, when the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. And I don't think he left him for very long, right? Because he continued all through his ministry, from the time of his baptism until the cross, he was under spiritual attack. And look at this right here, to an opportune time. Now, what do you think that means for us? You ever heard someone say, don't give the devil a foothold? If you give the devil a foothold, you're showing a sign of weakness and showing him where to attack or when is the opportune time, correct? We'll get to that. We'll get to that in the coming weeks. But I want you to know this. You, God loves you. He knows the number of hairs on your head. But there's also somebody else watching. And this somebody else wants to destroy you, to make you believe lies. He wants to destroy you, make you believe lies, and make you ineffective at serving the Lord Jesus Christ. I've used this analogy before, but I believe a lot of Christians live their lives just oblivious that this whole war thing is going on. And this is a good visual, but imagine seeing the movie Saving Private Ryan. And in the middle of the set with the bullets flying everywhere and people dying, there's a family having a picnic right there on the beach. Oblivious to what's going on. Don't live your lives like that. We need to engage the enemy. We need to be more passionate about prayer. We need to be more passionate about righteousness. So lie number one, God will not provide for you. God doesn't love you. Lie number two, God's way is too hard. Run the race that's set before you with endurance. Praise him the whole way. Praise him when it's tough. Praise him when it's great. Lie number three. Are you really a chill child of God? Are you really a saint? Are you really forgiven? Now Christ's keys to success during this time. First of all, he was led by the Spirit, even into great difficulty. He was full of the Holy Spirit and led into the wilderness. He was led by the Spirit. I can't tell you how important that is. If we've never paid much attention to the Holy Spirit in our lives, well, we should. Christ said, it is better that I go, because if I go, then I can send to you the helper. So it was better that he goes, because he can send the helper and indwell every believer that way. So we need to be depending on the Holy Spirit, being led by the Spirit. We need to have our spiritual eyes open and recognize what's going on around us. We need to be passionate about prayer. If God hasn't answered your prayer yet, it doesn't mean he's not going to. There's persistence in prayer. Keep praying passionately, persistently. And we also need the word, like Jesus. Every time he, a lie was placed in his mind, he replaced it with the word of God. He rejected it and replaced it with the word of God. Don't entertain those thoughts. You're no good. Don't entertain those thoughts. You're a sinner. You're no good. God can't use you. Don't entertain those thoughts. Those are lies. Replace it with the word. And through it all, no matter what, no matter if we're in the valley or we're on the mountaintop, whichever the case, trust God. You see what Jesus did? He was fully human. And he fully trusted God, tempted in every which way. Let's pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for Jesus Christ. And God, thank you. Wow, just thank you for his determination to not talk, take the easy way out, to not serve himself when he's almost dead from starvation. God, just thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you that from here, he went on to the cross, determined to carry out the will of God, to die as a sacrifice, to end all sacrifices, the blood sacrifice, the last true blood sacrifice, that by that shed blood, we would have the forgiveness of sins, not of works, so that no one can boast, but just by grace, a free gift. God, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise for just a couple of minutes.